Good evening. Welcome to Oral Baptist Church's prayer meeting and Bible study tonight. We've been studying through the book of Lamentations, and we're back here again tonight in the second half, or the second lesson, on Lamentations chapter 2. As we have been going through this, there have been some really um, important lessons that we have been learning, especially with regard to um, with regard to pain, a, a completely human condition under the fall, with regard to um, troubles or trials, with regard to the judgment of the Lord, and um, many similar topics like that. So tonight, as we are looking at uh, Lamentations chapter 2, we want to pick up um, where we left off last week, which was with recognizing God as eminently just, a righteous God, a God who executes justice. And building on that idea, I want to think about, um, uh, or something that has been going through my mind here uh, this week, is that God keeps really good records. And I had this uh, little little phrase running around in my mind, God is a, a data scientist. Right? God is a um, someone who keeps really good records and is, um, is not going to be caught unprepared or with less than effective um, perspective. So I think that's important for us to keep in mind um, as we take a look at these verses. Let's take, um, let's go back and read in Lamentations in chapter 2. Lamentations chapter 2 and we're going to pick up in verse 9 and read down to the end of the chapter. Lamentations 2, picking up in verse 9 and reading down to the end of the chapter. In this, in Lamentations chapter 2, the prophet or preacher, Jeremiah, is the one speaking. And he is speaking that which is true concerning the Lord and now concerning the city of Jerusalem. Remember that the city of Jerusalem is personified in a poetic sense as a lady, as a woman. And so the personal pronouns she and her in these passages refer to the city of Jerusalem and um, even a uh, you know, in a larger sense, the whole, the whole southern kingdom, uh, the the tribes of Judah, the kingdom of Judah, that was left to the sons of David after the split of the kingdoms. So it picks up here with the first uh, pronoun being her, referring to Jerusalem. Lamentations chapter two and verse nine says, "Her gates." are sunk into the ground. He hath destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. The law is no more. Her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit upon the ground and keep silence. They've cast up dust upon their heads. They've girded themselves with sackcloth. The virgins of Jerusalem hang down their heads to the ground. Mine eyes do fail with tears 
My bowels are troubled. My liver is poured out upon the earth for the destruction of the daughter of my people. Because the children and the sucklings swoon in the streets of the city. They say to their mothers, where is corn and wine? When they swooned as the wounded in the streets of the city, when their soul was poured out into their mother's bosom. What thing shall I take to witness for thee? What thing shall I liken to thee, O daughter of Jerusalem? What shall I equal to thee that I may comfort thee, O virgin daughter of Zion? For thy breach is great like the sea. Who can heal it? Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee, and they have not discovered thine iniquity to turn away thy captivity, but have seen for thee faults, burdens, and causes of banishment. All that pass by clap their hands at thee. They hiss and wag their head at the daughter of Jerusalem, saying, Is this the city that men call the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? All thine enemies have opened their mouths against thee. They hiss and gnash their teeth. They say, we have swallowed her up. Certainly this is the day that we looked for. We have found, we have seen it. Verse 17. The Lord hath done that which he devised. He hath fulfilled his word that hath that he had commanded in the days of old he hath thrown down and hath not pitied he hath caused thine enemy to rejoice over thee he hath set up the horn of thine adversaries their heart cried unto the lord o wall of the daughter of zion let tears run down like a river day and night Get thyself no rest, let, thine, the, let not the apple of thine eye cease. Arise, cry out in the night, in the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up thy hands toward him for the life of thy young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. Behold, O Lord, and consider to whom thou hast done this. Shall the women eat their fruit and children of a span long? Shall the priest and the prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? The young and the old lie in the ground, in the street. My virgins and my young men are fallen by the sword. Thou hast slain them in the day of thine anger. Thou hast killed and not pitied. Thou hast called as in a solemn day my terrors round about me so that in the day of the Lord's anger none escaped nor remained. Those that I have swaddled and brought up hath mine enemy consumed. And let's open up with prayer. Father, tonight as we consider these heavy, heavy words, may your Spirit give us perception and understanding that we might rightly interpret. Lord, cause us to see you as you are, truly, and not, Lord, be deceived by some figment of our own imagination. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in Lamentations, the second half of Lamentations chapter 2, we see first of all that leadership is broken. Leadership is broken. It uses the term here, the gates. Now, the word the gates in the Old Testament usually is talking about the place where the most traffic is of a city. Um, usually there would be uh, the arsenal there to defend that city. There would be um, the closest access 
for merchants coming in out of town to bring their wares here and to sell and to buy. And so the market would be there close. There would also be a section where um, there would be government, uh, whether it was built into the wall or chambers built over the wall or somehow connected to that part of the wall, there would be chambers of government. And therefore, the um, it was it was like whatever was of public importance and was happening, um, the people coming in and going out of the city could have the most up-to-date information about what the status of the politics of the city would be. And so um, the criers, the town criers, would be there close as well, letting everybody that's coming in or going out know. And so anything that had to do with public safety or uh, social structure took care uh, or happened in the gates, and it was the seat of government and the uh, and public affairs. So here, when it says the gates are sunken into the ground, um, notice that this construction is passive. Her is the pronoun, the feminine pronoun, referring to um, the city of Jerusalem, right? The lady, the city of Jerusalem. And he, which is in our second phrase, is um, the, is referring to the Lord and is referring to the first eight verses that pre just preceded verse nine and talking about the work that the Lord did in um, bringing about and in, in, in facing Jerusalem with the just penalty for their um, for the for the steps that they took against um, the city uh, against the Lord. In fact, um, in our family devotions, we are reading in, in Isaiah chapter 17, and the whole chapter of, I mean, sorry, Jeremiah chapter 17, and the whole chapter of Jeremiah 17, the Lord is reiterating to the nation of Israel that they need to keep the law of the Lord, and particularly, they need to obey the law of the Lord of the Sabbath day. And so um, this law of the Sabbath day is one of the laws that they had broken. And he emphasized it over and over again. In fact, that was one of the specific laws that was broken, which specifically caused the nation of Israel to... Um, go into captivity for 70 years. That's That was what determined the length of time that they um, were under the judgment of the Lord. And so the Lord was just, and he is being acknowledged here in verse 9 in that second phrase, he hath destroyed and broken her bars. He's the one that broke down any semblance of security and safety and protection that they had in order to allow their enemies access. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. Where are they? That includes Daniel, right? The, the prophet Daniel was one of the princes of Judah, along with his friends, the, the other three Hebrew children, along with the, um, the, the king Jehoiakim, who had been taken away, and um, his father Jehoiakim, um, they had been carried away into Babylon. So that's, that's where they resided. They resided in captivity to some degree. Some of them were, were, given, were trained and given positions in the kingdom, but they were among the Gentiles. They were no more in their home country or doing the um, 
the role or office that they had been uh, raised to do. The law is no more. Right? Who broke the law? It wasn't God. It was God's people that he had given to him. And whenever they broke that law and violated the covenant that underpinned that law, then they no more had any grounds on which for the law to continue as, a, as an institution of their nation and as an institution of the, um, of the, and, and we talked about this a little bit last week, right? That God was willing to violate each one of the covenants uh, or take a hard look and bring his wrath to bear, you know, um, on the laws regarding the family, the laws regarding um, the Mosaic law, the covenant reg with uh, regarding the Mosaic law, the covenant regarding the Davidic um, covenant and laws, the the Solomonic covenant and laws in keeping the the temple open, all those had been um, violated and therefore had fallen. Her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. Um, the elders. Of the daughter of Zion sit upon the ground and keep silence. They've cast up dust upon their heads. They've girded themselves with sackcloth. The virgins of Jerusalem hang down their heads to the ground. Notice that in these pictures, they are in a very passive relationship. Um, the first eight verses looked at God's active role in addressing the nation of Israel for her sins. These next section of verses are looking at passively how they are the recipients of this um, wrath of God, how they are the victims, if you will, not in the same sense of they are being victimized by God, but, but they are the recipients, they are the experiencers, um, they are the they're receiving the brunt of the action that God is taking. And as we look at and compare this work of suffering, this um this this process of suffering that came to God's people, sometimes we have um and I I try to compare it to myself and I think what is my natural response? whenever I see people going through difficult times, when I encounter people that have, um, that are, that have been victims of atrocities, victims of, um, and I'm going to use the word injustice. I know that doesn't compare with the justice of God, but let me just use the word violence. All right. People who have been victims of violence, what is our natural response to them? And unfortunately, um, my response hasn't been that good. I don't have that good of a record as far as re responding or reacting to people's um to people's trauma, to people, to the violence that has touched people, right? If it, if I come too close to it, one of the first reactions is embarrassment, right? What do I say? What do I do? Um, avoidance, right? Try to get away from there as quickly as possible. If I am forced into close proximity to um, to someone else's suffering. Over a period of time, I quickly become wearied. You see that in the picture that uh, of Job that we studied a, a, a year or so ago. His friends came, and at first, they were willing to sit quietly by and um, absorb the suffering that Job was going through. And then they got tired of just sitting there, and they had to find fault. And they had to find reasons, and they had to find excuses 
and they had to speak out. Um, of course, you know, with weariness, uh, the other one is just boredom. Um, even if we were to keep ourselves in that place, we, we, we quickly lose focus, lose interest, lose um, empathy for the person going through that suffering. But what was Jeremiah's re reaction? In verse 11, Jeremiah's reaction was quite the opposite. He says, mine eyes, mine eyes do fail with tears. He reacted with, with um, tears. He reacted with just, you know, gut level pain. He identified with the pain of the of the nation of Israel. Of course, I mean, he himself experienced it as well in a certain sense. He himself also, um, but the, the difference is that he had been warning them that this was going to happen. Not only that, but he had experienced persecution. He had been thrown in prison. He had been talked bad about. He had been um, contradicted, called a liar, all these things by the very people that are now suffering the wrath and the judgment of God. And yet, whenever the pain touched them, what was his response? What was his reaction? My eyes do fail with tears. My bowels are troubled. His the his that gut wrenching pain that um comes from someone who identifies very closely uses the analogy or the kind of the the figure of my liver um you know if you're so if you if you're experiencing um pain or or um uh if you are experiencing trauma, um, emotions at such a level that it literally affects your, um, you know, your stomach, right? You can't eat anything. You can't hold anything on your on your stomach. You can't, um, you know, it 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 causes so many um, psychosomatic. Um, symptoms, right? And the and this is because for the destruction of the daughter of my people, because the children and the sucklings swoon in the streets of the city. He saw the little children, uh, the the acts of violence, the atrocities of violence that ca that fell on the the youngest ones, the innocents, the children, the babies. The babies are saying to their mother, where's food? Where's drink? Where's anything that um, is sweet or that is pleasant or that is satisfying? They swooned as the wounded in the streets of the city when their soul was poured out. You know, the mother there not knowing what to do, not knowing how to help. And the baby literally dying in their mother's arms. And Jeremiah said it was as if it might as well have been in his own arms, right? It might as well have been in his um, kid that um, had experienced that. And we know there also from Jeremiah 17 that Jeremiah wasn't allowed to get married or have children at that time because... The Lord knew the experience that the city of Jerusalem was going through in, in the very near future. And um, so for Jeremiah, the whole nation was his adopted family. They were his wife and his children, right? The city of Jerusalem was his wife. The, the daughters of Zion were his children. And... He reacted, um, taking personally 
that that identification with them and with their pain. We have another picture of the prophet, and this is of Jesus himself. There is a connection between our eyes and our heart and our hands. And five times in the book of Matthew, it talks about the Lord. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, three times. Uh, Matthew 9, 36, when he saw the multitude says he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Matthew 14, 14, Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them and he healed their sick. Matthew 18, 27, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, loosed him and forgave him the debt. And I, I wrote the wrong scripture down, but Matthew 21 says that he, when he saw the city of Jerusalem, he, he cried, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and destroyest those that were sent unto you, how oft would I have gathered you as a chicken gathers her chicks under her, and you would not. So the Lord saw through those same eyes, right? And as we saw... The righteousness of God was fully effected by Jesus Christ, by dying and paying for the penalty um, that the wrath of God demanded. That brings us to verse 13. As the prophet is seeking for a response... He addresses the, the question of communication. If, if, if you as a preacher, or me as a, as a preacher, as a teacher, as a communicator, how many times have I asked this question? And, and Jeremiah asks this question of Jerusalem. He says, what thing shall I take to witness for thee? What kind of metaphor, what kind of simile, what kind of um, figure of speech can I use that will give you a, a, a true sense of the situation that we are looking at here? What thing shall I liken to thee, O daughter of, Zion, of Jerusalem? What, what simile, what metaphor? What shall I equal to thee that I may comfort thee? So this, um, what figure of speech can I use, first of all, to show them the truth, but secondly, to express to them in a way that they can understand and appreciate the love that he has for him. And, and this is the heart of the gospel. The gospel is good news, but the good news that is not, doesn't get through, doesn't penetrate, doesn't, isn't heard by the um by the recipient of it is not good news it reminds me of second corinthians chapter 6 second corinthians chapter 6 I'm sorry, I can't um, lay my finger on it right now. 
says, well, um, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, here it is. It says, I have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servant, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so, as Jeremiah is seeking how can we remove the scales from their eyes? How can we get our communication across? How can we cause this people to see, to hear, to understand? Uh, another passage that um, Jeremiah himself preached um, early on is, he asks, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no healer there? How then is the hurt of the daughter of my people not healed? Why, why is the sickness still there? Why is the rebellion still continuing? Why is the cancer of sin and disobedience still continuing if there is an available remedy? It's a rhetorical question. We know that there is a remedy. We know that it is the Lord Jesus Christ. That He, by the righteousness of God, paid the penalty for sin. And all who come to Him believing and receiving are free. But, what do we see? We see people who haven't received that comfort. Back in verse 13, it says, For thy breach is great, like the sea. The, the, the gap between God and man through sin is how, how big? How big is the gap between God and man? It is as big as the sea, as broad as the sea, and no way to, go, cut, no way to cross it. There is a great gulf fixed, as it says in, in Luke chapter 16, between the rich man and Lazarus, the man in hell, and the man in paradise. There is a great gulf fixed, and there is no way to bridge that gap. And yet Jesus has provided a way. Who can heal thee? Another rhetorical question, it's Christ, right? Is there no balm in Gilead? Yes. The answer is yes. The answer is Jesus. And in him, all the promises of God are yea, and in him, amen. All the word is, a, is a pointing to the work of Christ. Just as sin shows us our need, Christ shows us our solution for our need. Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things for thee, and they've not discovered thine iniquity to turn away thy captivity, but have seen for thee false burdens and causes of banishment. The by and large in in Jeremiah's day, he would preach and nine other people would preach contrary to everything that Jeremiah said. Jeremiah would say, this city is being destroyed because they won't listen to the law. And all the other preachers would say, y'all are God's covenant people. There's nothing going to happen to you. 
There's no way that God's going to violate his promise. And so they would bring about this half-baked view of the righteousness of God. He would, they would preach peace. You're going to have peace. Don't worry about the, the armies coming. Don't worry about it. They're not going to take this city. They would preach peace, peace, when there is no peace. What, is, what does Romans 5 say? Therefore, let me, let me, let me read it for you. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only peace that is, is possible isn't through um, our efforts, and it's not through our parentage, and it's not through our status, and it's not through our institutions, but it is through the person of Jesus Christ. And only through him is there peace. Thy prophets have seen vain and foolish things. The enemies continue to gloat there in verse 15 of Lamentations chapter 2. All that pass by clap their hands at thee. They hiss and wag their head at the daughter of Jerusalem, saying, Is this the city that men call the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? All thine enemies have opened their mouth against thee. They hiss and gnash the teeth. They say, We have swallowed her up. Certainly this is the day we looked for. We have found we have seen it. So in this day of utter um, destruction, of sad um, reciprocation for their, excuse me, for their sin, in this day of them facing the, the cause of their uh, the, uh, sorry, facing the consequence of their disobedience. Of course, they have their enemy just sitting on the sideline waiting to gloat, waiting to feed on it. And you have a, a very, uh, uh, an interesting scenario. I wanted to, this made me think of a verse. Um, and as we think about the case of the case of um, suffering and the case of violence in the world. And we think about, um, you know, trying to interpret properly and try to, to um, rightly divide the scriptures. There, there's, a, there's a contrast in... Um, violence. I want to um, point this out. Um, the, there's more than one reason for sin occurring. I'm sorry, for, um, for pain occurring. There's more than one reason for distress or trouble it's more than one reason for um sickness or disease right i wanted to clarify something that in this this modern um, moment in history, 
the course of sin has has been cycling through society for a long period of time. Remember that not too long after the creation, the God looked down and saw that the continual process of man's existence was an exponential increase in evil. And you see that there in Genesis chapter 6. And God sent a great judgment at that time against uh, upon the world, which we call the great flood of Noah's day. And we found that Noah himself personally and his family found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We see there at the conclusion of that flood that the Lord brought a rainbow. He put a bow in the clouds to indicate that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood. And yet, whenever the Lord took a look at that um, situation that was there, in Genesis 9, he concluded that the circumstances hadn't really changed that much. Okay, so the population was depopulated, right? from however many millions there were up down to eight. The population had depopulated, but the condition of corruption and exponential growth of evil hadn't changed at all. And we see in Genesis 9, I'm sorry, I'm looking for it. Okay, very last verse of, of Genesis 8. The Lord smelled after, after Noah had offered a sacrifice, after he had come out, off of the ark, and after he had, um, after the end of the judgment had been appeased, he came off the ark. It says, The Lord smelled a sweet savor. The Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of the man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. So the imagination of man's heart was evil after the flood, just as it was in Genesis 6 before the flood. The condition of the heart had not changed. But yet the Lord accepted the sacrifice, the substitutionary sacrifice for sin. Okay? So, as sin continues to exist in this world, and as we, as humans, continue to face it, I want to clarify that this earth... Um, where we live, say, for example, is not under 
that same um, covenant construct as the nation of Israel was. We don't have a lineage of kings that is under the Davidic covenant. We don't have a governmental institutions that are under the Mosaic covenant. We don't have the um, uh, you know uh, all these institutions in the same sense that the nation of Israel did. They didn't have the, um, the, the, the Solomonic covenant in which God would answer any prayers prayed toward the temple in Jerusalem, necessarily. But what we have is, through Christ, we have approaching towards a new kind of covenant... A covenant, and, and Jeremiah goes in, into detail, and, and we may not have time to delve all through it tonight, but Jeremiah in chapter 31, he begins to unre unveil this new covenant that the Lord is promising. The church is a new kind of covenant. It's not um, a physical institution, in the sense that the church can never be touched or um, violated as the nation of Israel, all of the covenants of the Lord are true through His Son, Jesus Christ. Okay? All of the covenants are true through His Son, Jesus Christ. So the church stands or falls only in as much as um, it is in right relation to his son, Jesus Christ. Secondly, um, there are no political um, institutions that have a special relation with the Lord, like particular nations. Okay? And so, like, certain people um, aren't going to feel the sickness, the, 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 the judgment of sickness, because they're in a special relationship to the Lord, right? We can't look around and say, well, that nation over there, you know, in Asia or in Europe or, you know, you know, um, South Korea didn't have as bad a case because they're a more favored nation than, than the U S or than England or than, you know, Italy or, or whatever. Um, so there aren't any political institutions that have, a, um, um, most favored status in the sense of covenant with the Lord. And so as as so as Christians, I, I, I think if we were to do the statistics across the board, we would probably see that there is a, a um there aren't any special statistics that people who are Christian um are less susceptible to COVID nineteen than people who are not Christian. I'm not um, saying that across the board. I'm just saying, as humans um, in this fallen world, we are going to be um, subject to the same kinds of human suffering that those around us are. And yet, individually, the Lord is using each set of circumstances to speak to us personally, right? And to um, individual churches and, and groups of people um, in, in small groups. And he is dealing with them in very specific ways and, and teaching us and, and bringing us through specific um, uh, circumstances in order for us to serve him. If we were to go 
just say, for example, to the book of Revelation um, in chapters 1, 2, and 3, and we see how the Lord sent special messages to individual churches at that time who were in the world, who were facing persecution, who were facing some of the same um, political scenarios that their neighbors uh, outside the church were facing. Yet the Lord had a special message to each church. And so as we take a look at um, this, this scenario of judgment and this scenario of violence and pain, don't let us lose perspective on the operation of grace in our hearts the operation of grace in our churches, the operation of grace through us towards those around us. Do you understand? The Lord is accomplishing His work, and He's accomplishing His will, and we see that reiterated, right? If we go back to Lamentations chapter 2, the first eight verses is God's action. Right? The Lord hath covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger, and he hath cast her down from heaven unto the earth, the beauty of Israel, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord hath swallowed up all the inhabitants um, of Jacob, and so on and so forth. Then we come down to verse 9 through 16, and we look at the passive circumstances, right? Jerusalem has been the recipient of, of violence. They have been the recipient of pitiable conditions. They've been at the brunt of their enemies' um, attacks. They've been at the brunt of the onslaught of, of sickness and pain. And yet, God is accomplishing His work in every aspect he is nuanced in the way in which he deals with us as his people. The Lord hath done that which he had devised. And, he's de and his devices today in this world are devices of grace, right? Um, it is in, we are, as we are in the church age, we're in the age in which the church is to be preaching the gospel, be um, building the kingdom, be communicating, and be, right, making disciples, baptizing them, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you. That's the age in which we're in, right? So even as this world is facing the ups and downs and the throes of sin and the throes of the curse and the throes of pain and violence, we have to keep perspective of where we're at as his people in this moment. Right? Jeremiah was there. He was right in the middle. He suffered the same thing that the people who were evildoers suffered. In fact, he suffered more because he could see the other side. He could see the gospel, right? As gospelers, we are going to suffer. Christ himself, he suffered um, fatigue, and he suffered hunger and thirst in a human condition when he was here. And yet he went about his ministry healing and preaching and then laying down his life for his enemies. So let's not lose sight of where we are. In, so in, 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 in relation to this, the Lord addressed people. Some people came up to him in Luke chapter 13, and I'm, I'm about to close. 
In Luke chapter 13, he says, There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans. There was a, a faction of rebels that decided to stand against the nation of Rome whose blood Pilate had mingled with the sacrifices. He burned people on the same altar that was supposed to hold the sacrifice of the Lord. And he desecrated that place. And he, and he brought extreme shame to the Galileans at that time. Right? Pilate was ruthless. Jesus answered and said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? Nay, I tell you, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He said, Do you think that they were experiencing a special un... Um, un were they particularly unworthy of, of experiencing that level of pain or persecution or trauma. It says they weren't more sinful or less sinful than anyone else. It says we're all under the same curse of sin as humans. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all the men that dwell in Jerusalem at that time? Nay, I tell you, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So the message isn't to interpret some special um, particular sin that God was addressing. There's not a, in other words, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation at this stage of human history. There's not a one-to-one -one correlation. Well, you, you did this, and therefore God's getting you on this. You did this, and God's getting you on this. God is keeping records. God is keeping very accurate accounts. But in this age of grace... He is extending a message of repentance. A message in which um, we have the opportunity to hear the gospel. Us, we have the opportunity to preach the gospel to those that haven't heard. And they have an opportunity to repent and to be saved before the judgment day of Christ. Okay? So let's try to balance, as we study the book of Lamentations... Let's try to balance that within the perspective of the new covenant in which we live, in which Jeremiah had introduced there in chapter 31. Um, unfortunately, I'm not going to get all these last few verses gone through. The morning there in, as um, a prayer response, right? Their hearts cried unto the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion. Let tears run down like a river day and night. Give thyself no rest. Let not the apple of thine eye cease. God says, repent. The preacher says, the Lord says to you, O daughter of Zion, repent. Sorrow towards God, but a sorrow that leads to repentance. A, a sorrow that leads to turning and changing. Arise, Cry it in the night, in the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up thy hands toward him for the life of your young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street. And the Lord sends his message. Behold, O Lord, consider to whom thou hast done this. Jeremiah is still struggling and walking through this this the injustice, the social injustice that he sees there and just trying to wrap his mind around it. And yet we offer the message of salvation and the message of grace through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, as we think about and look at these verses, help us to understand. Give us a heart for your people. Give us a heart for our neighbors. And Lord, may we be faithful to preach all that you've commanded us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord add his blessing to you. Good night.